Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban is the only Harry Potter DVD that I own. I can't remember when I bought it or where, but I can remember watching and re-watching it through my teenage years. It was released when I was 13, the same age that Harry is when he enters Hogwarts for his third year, and it seemed to be the only film in the series that I would always return to, but I wasn't sure why. But then, last year, I put it on again, and it became clear to me. It was the tone, the subtlety of treatment, the reality of the world, and most importantly for me, the score. There are a number of reasons why Azkaban is a departure, but it can mostly be ascribed to a change in director. Chris Columbus had decided to step back from directing the series whilst working on Chamber of Secrets, so it fell to the creative team to find someone new. Alfonso Cuaron was brought in to reimagine the cinematic world of Harry Potter. This was a director whose previous high-profile films about children had not relied upon Hollywood cliches or archetypes, but dealt instead with the emotional essence of being a child and dealing with growing up. His approach to Azkaban was to treat it as a story about family, relationships and love that happened to be set in a magical world, instead of one driven by the magical elements. He brought new artistic cinematic techniques, designed longer, more developed shots, used a darker colour palette and daringly redesigned Hogwarts. Hagrid's hut was moved, he added the footbridge and shot the outdoor scenes in Glencoe and Loch Ness. He wanted the world to feel more real, more alive and more connected to nature. And you can see this clearly in the way that Quaron jumps forward in time by using the transition from season to season. This naturalistic approach and the shift in visual landscape though had to be accompanied by a shift in the sonic landscape. John Williams' scores for the first two films were used primarily to embody the fantasy elements of the world, to act as an accompaniment to anything magical that was happening on screen. He used a number of light motifs, musical ideas that are associated with a character, feeling or event. The scores for these two films were mainly in one style, late romantic orchestral music inspired by composers like Korngold, Mahler and Tchaikovsky. But this wouldn't work when paired with Quaron's approach for Prisoner of Azkaban. Williams stripped back his motifs for the third film. The only idea that was reused more than once was Hedwig's theme, and a variant of it in the form of Double Trouble, and he introduced only a small number of new motifs. But the largest change that Williams made was to produce music in a number of different styles. The score still relies heavily on romantic orchestral music, but it also uses experimental jazz for the night bus sequence. Avant-garde orchestral music for the Dementors and the Boggart. Choral music to represent the Patronus charm. And a medieval ensemble to accompany scenes in and around Hogwarts. This was to move in line with Quaron's desire to make the world more realistic. The music was also designed by Williams and Quaron to serve the action, not merely accompany it. And with the shift to longer, more developed sequences, Williams had to create musical ideas that could be drawn out and then match the emotional and physical weight of the visuals. This is demonstrated perfectly in Buckbeak's flight. The music in this sequence, its harmonic and rhythmical shifts, are all designed to carefully reflect the visual cues throughout. Well done, Harry. Well done. It begins with thunderous timpani and tom-toms to match the beating of Buckbeak's hooves. then an ascending string line as they take off, followed by rising horn and woodwind lines. The soaring tune in F minor that we then hear feels almost weightless, with the strings gliding above the rhythmical patterns in the woodwind and brass. But the music shifts even higher into B minor up an augmented fourth, then into C minor up a semitone. Then as Buckbeak heads down towards the lake, the score moves to music with faster subdivisions, as well as a much faster harmonic rhythm. The chords change every bar now, from D flat major to B minor, to F sharp minor to C sharp minor and so on. The unsettled nature of the music gives the feeling of joyous, restless energy. Then as Harry stretches out his arms, we return to the opening melody, now in E minor. This is the first time Harry has felt free. He is experiencing complete freedom and complete joy. Finally, as they float back to the ground, we then hear descending lines in the woodwind and percussion, leading to the B major tonality that finishes the sequence. The music in this scene allows you to feel the action instead of just looking at it. 
it allows you to experience what Harry is experiencing. This focus on the literal and the weight that is placed on creating a living cinematic world in Azkaban leads to some incredibly inventive musical features. The most prominent of these is the use of diegetic or source music, music that features as part of the world instead of being part of the accompanying incidental music that makes up the score. Perhaps the most interesting example happens right at the beginning of the film when Aunt Marge is visiting the Dursleys and is literally blown up by Harry. Let me tell you. As Aunt Marge starts to slowly expand, we hear a chirpy waltz in G major. When she eventually floats away, the waltz finishes on a bombastic G major chord. It then cuts straight away to Dudley fixated on the ballroom dancers on the TV, where we hear La Compasita, a tango played in G minor. The camera then shifts to Harry, who storms up to his bedroom, slams the door, and we hear a gentle tune played on a celeste in G minor. The continuity of harmonic language here, the fact that all the ideas are in G major or G minor, is so subtle but crucial, as it provides a link between the incidental and the diegetic music, from the absurdest visuals of Aunt Marge flying off, back into the real world, back inside the house, into Harry's mind. So when we see Harry looking longingly at the photograph of his parents, this moment of deep sadness and fragility is felt even more acutely. This theme, this motif, which is introduced for the first time here, is the most important musical idea in the whole of Prisoner of Azkaban, and perhaps John Williams' finest in all of his output. This is a window to the past, although I think of it more as a theme of longing, of family and of love. The Prisoner of Azkaban is ultimately a narrative journey. Harry is learning to embrace the reality of the death of his parents, but is also coming to terms with his relationship with Sirius Black. This melodic theme, therefore, has to develop with the shift in Harry's understanding as he learns the truth. And John Williams does this in a very intelligent way, through instrumentation. A Window to the Past is first played by the Celeste, the bell-like instrument that was famously used for Hedwig's theme. But the second time we hear it, it's played by a recorder, accompanied by the harp and eventually strings and an oboe. <laughs> he had a certain, shall we say, talent for trouble. The softer sound of the recorder lends a more plaintive, grounded feel to the melody. Talent. It's tinged with nostalgia, but there was a warmth that was missing from the first time we heard the motif. We then hear it played by the clarinet, followed by the flute, the second time Lupin discusses Harry's past with him. leading naturally into the soft horn rendition of the tune as Harry looks out on his friends leaving for Hogsmeade. The horn version seems to be a direct evolution of the version played by the recorder. It feels like the motif is building and growing. And although the association hasn't been made yet, the horn version will eventually come to represent much more than loss or sadness. Harry will ultimately use his longing for love and connection to give him strength. Strength that will allow him to battle inner pain, as well as to overcome the physical challenges he will face in the form of the Dementors. The Patronus Charm, the only spell that can subdue a Dementor, requires a memory of intense happiness. So when Harry uses the memory of his parents to conjure the charm, we hear the most triumphant version of A Window to the Past. Ecstatic horns playing on top of a rich choral texture. This is also mirrored when Harry conjures the Patronus to save Sirius and his past self by the lake. The final time we hear the melody is during Harry's last conversation with Sirius in the film, the longest rendition of the motif. It starts off being played by the recorder, but this is followed directly by a version played by horns. The progress of the motif throughout the whole of the film is being mapped here, from the first full rendition during Harry's conversation with Lupin on the bridge to the climactic conclusion by the lake. But importantly, this rendition of the melody is not the same as the beginning. It has now been expanded and developed and is eventually taken over by the full orchestra. The evolution of the idea is now complete, marking Harry's full understanding of the truth and his realization that love has a transformative power even in the face of sometimes overwhelming darkness. I really think this film is a masterpiece of visual and audio design, and I hope you agree. And I also hope you enjoyed my analysis of the score. If you have a particular film score in mind that you would like me to analyse, then please do let me know in the comments below.
See you next time.